Hello and thanks for joining us. I am David Gauntler. I'm here with Valeria. Valeria's going to say hi. Hi, everyone. Tell them something about yourself, Valeria. I'm a master's student in the Concord, from Concord. I'm in second year and I work with David in the Creativity Everything Lab. So we've been doing research recently with COVID and creativity and many other things happening this year. Um, and it's been incredible. And now we're here today to ask David some questions and then get some insight about new researchers and many questions that we all have. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm smirking at the responsibility involved in that because I've already, my main note at the bottom of this says an arrogant proposition. I'm coming on to that later. <laughs> Seems like an arrogant proposition, doesn't it? Um, so, um, because <laughs> this is called advice for emerging researchers which makes it sound like I have the answers to things I obviously don't um I can only give you uh, some thoughts about my experiences the catalyst asked if I could you know the catalyst asked everybody if they can do a thing they asked me if I could do a thing and maybe offer some of my wisdom so there you go I'm blaming them. Um, and at one point in its development, it was called um, Advice from an Old Person, which I thought was a good title. <laughs> but it's not a very appealing title, is it? Uh, uh, yes, I'll stop digging myself in or out of that hole. Um, so, and obviously, so there's, there's things, I'm gonna have a health warning in a sec, which is that like my experience has mostly been in the UK because um, I, had an academic career in the UK until two and a half years ago when I started one here instead in Canada because I got a tier one Canada research chair. Um, so I should say something about me if you don't know anything about me, but I don't want to talk say a lot about me, but just, you know, <laughs> sort of the point, isn't it? Um, but I, I had jobs at uh, like three or four uh, universities in the UK. Um, I got going quite quick because I had my PhD done uh 23 years ago, I worked out earlier, um, and and I've done a number of books and things since then, um, and yeah, so here we are. The arrogant thing is, uh, yeah. So obviously, my advice is is only based on my experience, and you know, if you think it sounds like it's definitely going to be wrong for you, then don't listen to a word of it. Um, the UK is different to Canada. The academic system is different but also kind of similar, but also different, leading to all kinds of bits of confusion where I, you know, I think that I understand something that turns out I've got it completely upside down and so on, which are always very interesting experiences. Um, so, so my experience comes from a somewhat different background, but it's similar-ish. I think the things I'm going to say apply in that context too. Um, I have the privilege of being a white man, which, you know, has probably made some difference because it does, doesn't it? Um, I, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I kind of thought I should sort of point out, like I didn't have tons more privilege. Like I'm just arrived in this job because I've got like I'm related to the Queen or something. My parents didn't go to university for one thing, so I, I sort of I didn't have a naturally academic kind of background. Um, but it hasn't all been a hellish struggle <laughs> either. Okay, uh, let's start. Ding. Yes, that's the right one. Good. So, health warning, I'm not from around here. So, uh, yeah, if you want to ignore everything I say, the easiest thing to think to yourself is, oh, this doesn't apply because we're in Canada, it's different. But I don't think it is that different. Um, but I've already given you those health warnings. So, here's my list of points. I made a list of points. The first one is about getting noticed. But obviously, it's not just getting noticed by jumping up and down and being irritating. Get noticed. But obviously get noticed for doing something good. Innovative work, useful resources, or both. Um, like when I started, yeah, the, the other thing, yeah, the other bit of difference, the other health warning is that my experience of coming up through this kind of system is historical in the sense that like when I was starting out, I just got my PhD in 1997 ages ago and at that point well then the internet still seemed like a sparkly wonderful new thing and i set up a website around that time called theory.org.uk where i had all kinds of 
resources and quizzes and and slightly silly things i did trading cards theorist trading cards with lots of different men and women uh theorists um which, which were kind of fun thing eventually they were published as actual cards but the online set was the thing that uh Lots of people like that around the world and it got written about in newspapers around the world and stuff. Uh, and it's, you know, it's sort of a gimmick to draw attention to a website, but also a fun thing. People have tried playing it. It sort of worked. Um, and the point of that was, it was a thing that in part was about getting noticed. I don't know if that was my primary conscious motivation. I mean, it wasn't my primary conscious motivation. I was trying to just make a fun website. Um, but that worked in that sense. And that was also a time when people like you actually looked at websites for for entertainment, as it were. Whereas now we look at social media for a similar purpose, I suppose. Um, and there were less websites. That's the other bit about the being a sort of the privilege of being from the past. In this case, is that there was a small number of interesting websites about these kinds of things, media and culture and communication and stuff. Um, and and I'd made one of them, so. So that was good. Whereas now there's a lot of everything and it's harder to break out, probably. Um, yeah, that's that point. Valeria, uh, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I yeah, I think. I, I think that I, I wanted to go back a little bit about what you were saying. Uh, you said that new researchers need to be bold and that being bold is something that Canadian academia needs. And that's something that goes back to when you were saying that you come from the UK. I also come from South America, I'm Colombian, so I am not from Canada um, either. And that's something that I wanted to ask you about working internationally. And yeah, of course, it's not like you were saying, it's not the same, it's uh, similar in some ways, academia everywhere. But you can relate it to getting noticed as well, but as, in, as a general thing that as a first point, just how has how that has been for you like working in canada and even advice for someone that's that wants to go from the to the uk for do, doing their phd or just going to do academic work in any other place just being in a new place that you haven't been before doing academic work ah yeah thank you interesting um on so there's a thing there's a thing where you're inviting me to comment on the canadian academic system which i'll do in a minute because that's fun <laughs> uh, <laughs> um the thing about internationally, and you know this one as well, is that moving to a different country is hard. I think I found it harder than I thought it would be. I partly blame I blame celebrity culture. You know the fact that like you just like, <laughs> like you read like you know you read interviews with well known actors or pop stars or whatever, and they're like, oh, I've I've moved to LA now, or I've moved to Australia now, or whatever, and they just like you know people appear to just bob around the world, and also some academics seem to just blob around the world, and suddenly you know they're in oh now I'm in San Francisco, I got a cool new job here and all that. Um, if you got a family and children, which I have in particular, that's what made it hard. If you were 25 and single, it'd be different. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. Um, the adjustment and the whole moving, they totally uproot everything you've established. Um, and especially if you've been in one place quite a long time. So I've been in the UK for, you know, at that point, 40 odd years in my life. Um, and and you sort of don't quite realise, I think, the extent to which you've just established roots and networks and stuff there. And I kind of, <laughs> on, on the arrogantly point, I think I kind of arrogantly thought, well, you know, I'm cool here. I can go over there and be cool over there. Uh, and and then you arrive over here, and it's like nobody knows who you are, and they don't care. <laughs> Why would they? And and it's easy to overlook that as well if you've built up kinds of social and cultural capital in a place, and then you just go to a totally different place. They don't care. They're not interested. Uh, it should it should be a sobering experience as well, helping helping people like me to be less arrogant. So um, that might be good. On the Canadian thing. How did, uh, let's just ask you though, uh, you, so you came from Colombia to here, you arrived in Canada at the point of starting to do ComCult, MA, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. I was working in Colombia and then I came here to do my, my master's and it was an experience just similar, I guess, in some ways, just being, being in a new place and starting a new graduate program where, you know, you have all this pressure on your shoulders uh, being in a new place and not COVID, but that's not supposed to happen every yeah. year. Um, <laughs> But yeah. And just all the systems for everything, you don't know what they are and you don't really know how to get a bank account, you don't know how to get a driving license and all those things, and all those things take absolutely ages. You can uh, all imagine that. Yeah, don't they? Yes. 
Uh, the Canadian thing, yeah, because you were saying you reminded me about the blurb for this session. The blurb for this session says something about the need to be bold and that Canadians should be bolder. <laughs> Very rude suggestion. Um, but I do find I find people quite cautious here, and in particular, young researchers or up and coming researchers tend to seem. I'm not being rude, it's just an observation, tend to seem a bit sort of fearful about being judged and doing the wrong thing kind of thing, um, which is understandable. You know, I feel sympathy for those people fearing that, but I, think, I don't want them to think that. I want them to be more um, challenging of the systems in, in content terms, like the things that they're studying when they're very adventurous and challenging and good and lots of really interesting social justice stuff. And, and that's, all, that's all exciting. The content is good, but then the kind of the forms tend to be quite conventional. Um, you know, conferences that look like what I think conferences look like 30 or 40 years ago. I wasn't there, actually, but, you know, what I imagine they look like 30 years ago. And, and, and the interest in journals that people don't read and all of that. Um, and a fear of doing things more adventurously surprises me. Um, one explanation I've got for that, which may or may not be true. Shall I say my explanation? Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's true though. But I think it's I, I suspect it's to do with the thing that like it's like so I'm from I'm from England, where they sort of invented universities, sort of. Uh, I'm sure there were universities elsewhere as well, but England probably likes to think they invented the idea of the university. Um and and has been doing that for whatever, 400 years or something. Um and in Canada, all of the universities are much newer than that for reasons that we know. Um, and so then I think when they, the Canadians then sort of want to imitate what they think the, the British model is, but they overdo it because they're doing a thing that was like, maybe it was the British model 50 years ago, but now um, the things that they do in Britain have kind of evolved. And meanwhile, uh, the Canadian academic culture still seems to be trying to stick to lots of kind of stuffy, sort of elitist, old-fashioned things that they gave up on in Britain, you know, 30 years ago. <laughs> that is a very crude way of putting it, and it's not true at all. But it might be a bit true. Anybody want to express an opinion about that? Specific examples? Can I give examples? Um, the, just the, the um, it's, what is it? Very good, very good question. Um, it's the sort of old fashioned interest in like texts in peer reviewed journals and the sort of obsession with that. There's a sort of obsession with that in the UK as well, but we're happy to break out into different forms. And in Canada, it seems to be kind of more risky and crazy to be breaking out into different forms. Um, the fact that the, the only uh, practice based PhD that there is in Canada is in Bryson because FCAT had to create it because otherwise people were like flying to Glasgow to do their PhDs because you couldn't do a practice-based PhD in Canada. That was surprising. Um, the conferences seem quite staid and, and formulaic. Um, those kind of things it just seemed like old fashioned academic ways of doing things without What is much a practice-based PhD? Sorry, Grace? Sorry, what is a practice-based PhD? Uh-huh, practice-based You're going PhD. a bit fast. No, that's okay, yeah. Um, Practice-based research is where you explore a research question through doing or making something. And Canadian PhDs, I am told, have always just been basically uh, text. You know, you write 100,000 words of text, and that's what a PhD is. Um, and so you might be doing some kind of creative practice on the side, but you had to submit a thing which is just a written big thing as big as any of the other things about that in a practice-based phd well then you can be the creative practice is incorporated in the exploration of the research question that's what it is and fcad is launching one which begins in 2021 and otherwise you don't have them in canada that's the that's the simplest version in fact, I think there's PhD programs where you can stir in some elements of practice. That's got to be the case. Um, but having an actual practice-based PhD is a first for FCAT, apparently. But thanks for asking, Grace. Should we go on to... I think we need to get a move on. Um, 
do something distinctive. Obviously, you want to do something distinctive, but I think it is important to be doing something distinctive and not just adding to the pile of things, which I've got a slide about later on as well. Methods can be a good way of doing this. So uh, obviously, anybody like doing a PhD or doing some research, they, they are exploring a thing that hasn't been done before. We always aim to do that. And even if you're on ground, which has been trod before, uh, you do it in a new way because it's you doing it. So originality kind of arises just from the fact that you're doing it a different way to anybody else doing it. So that's good. But a particular way to be distinctive, I think, is with methods because there tends to be quite a sort of fixed platter of methods that people choose something from. And in fact, you can innovate on methods and make up your own method. And then, and then the thing becomes interesting because you've not only got the results, everybody's got results from the method they did. But if you've got a new method, well, then you've got two things to talk about because you can talk about your new method as well as talking about what you learned from your new method. So uh, that's good. Uh, Valeria? No, I was just thinking about what you were saying about methods. and like, yeah, of course. I think that from my experience being in, a, in the MA, I think that the methods that we learn, or at least that in my experience I learned uh, by doing the the... There's actually a class about methods. It's just very um, like typical methods that you always kind of find in articles, like uh, content analysis and discourse analysis and uh, statistics kind of stuff and all that. But I think that this is a very important point and something that it will be encouraging for people to try to do things in another way. I think that we always focus on finding uh, different results but trying the, the same methods that we have always been mm. uh, doing. But I think that this will be a very important thing for new researchers to do is just that not just trying to find uh, new different answers and new different topics, but also trying to find new ways to get to these answers or these topics, which I think is very interesting as well. Yeah. Yeah. If I, um, I don't want to, <laughs> I was going to say, I don't want to keep talking about my stuff, but I suppose that, that is, point. if I could do an example of, you might be thinking, what's an example? How can you make up a method? But like in my, uh, I started doing a thing where you get people in social science research, you always just talk to people and you expect that you ask them a question and they're going to be able to give you a reply straight away, even though it's kind of unfair because you've been thinking about your thing a lot and they may not have thought about it at all. And, and you expect them to be able to generate language instantly and you write that down as being what their thoughts are. Um, what I found was if you give people a creative activity to do, they get more time to think about the thing that you're trying to ask them about and they can make something about that thing and they can look at it and they can talk to you about that thing as if it's something separate from either of you and refine it and you give them more time. And I definitely found that the words that they say when you just ask them a question um, are, are kind of one take on their beliefs or knowledge. Um, but if you give them more time and give them a the chance to go through a creative process, you get much deeper, richer things, and things which sometimes contradict what they would have originally said or what they did originally say. Uh, that's an example of that. Claire Danek in the chat. I like Claire Danek. <laughs> uh, I only know Claire Danek from Twitter, but she's great. I'm in a department at the University of Leeds. That's also where I used to work. But that's not, I don't know Claire Danek by that reason. Um, in the UK, where probably half the researchers are doing practice-based PhDs. There you go. It's a performance slash drama department. Creative methods, e.g. arts-based methods, is a growing area in the UK. Yes, it is. That's because we started propagating it about 20 years ago. Good. Um, I do have one question about this, just a final one. And it's about if you have a new method, like probably you don't know the answer to this question, but how do you actually make that a reality for like something that you have like you, like you can do it and you have like an actual framework of work so that so that you can say that this is an actual method that you're working with i think yeah i think you can just do it but obviously when it's a new one and not just an off-the-shelf one you need to do more work to kind of document what the process is meant to be and what the under underlying ideas are and how you can support it but then that's an interesting project in itself and if you're doing a phd it gives you a whole extra couple of chapters to talk about that so you're right, you totally do need to support it with argument and evidence and, and just sort of establishing it as a kind of method. But it's good and interesting thing to do. Invent a method. Okay. Ding. That's the same point, really. Originality can be in how you do it. We tend to think about originality, I think, in terms of like trying to find some patch of turf which has not previously been studied. Um, but that's not the only way to be original. There's also ways of being original in terms of how you do the thing. 
that's not necessarily just methods as well. It might be in terms of how you uh, how you talk about what you've found, the things you generate to illustrate your findings. Um, yeah, different media you could be putting that in, different ways of communicating results, all of that. I'm going to move along. This is the point I mentioned earlier. I think, and this is an ambitious one, but I think it's always a good ambition. Um, you don't just want to be adding a grain to the pile, by which I mean, you know, there's there may be already a uh, hundred studies of reality TV, and you're going to study a different reality TV show which hasn't previously been studied and add it to the pile of that. That doesn't sound very rewarding to me. <laughs> you're just adding a little bit onto a pile. That's just an example, but you know, that kind of thing. Um, trying to create a whole new world of something seems much more exciting. And, you know, that's, that's sort of too ambitious, you know, <laughs> but, but trying to unlock some new way of looking at a thing or trying to unlock something. So it's like, oh, this is an area which previously people weren't thinking of as being an area at all. That's a thing to aim for, at least. I think it's nice to have that ambition. Does that sound crazy? No, not at all. It, that sounds like something that now we have to think about what I'm inventing in this new uh, thing. But I think it's good to think about it in those terms. I mean, saying uh -huh. what is new about what I'm doing. Uh -huh. And ways to open things up is often a good thing to do is by combining perspectives that have previously been applied to one area to something totally different. Or taking, sometimes you could take a historical kind of theorist and apply them to something new that wasn't around at that time. Those kind of things. Taking something from over here and something from over here and crashing them together wouldn't always work. But sometimes you can do that in a really interesting way so that uh, they illuminate each other or the old thing. Illuminates the thing. Don't be led by funding. That's an interesting one. Um because it's sort of a taken for granted thing in academia that you are led by funding, I think. But um, I, to do my example again, because that's, <laughs> um, I didn't apply for funding for anything for like, uh, t like 10 years. Yeah, after my PhD, I was then an academic for 10 years. And that's possibly my golden period, that period. I wrote quite a lot of books and did a lot of stuff. Um, and had children at that point um, and I didn't apply for funding for anything because um, I thought I seemed to notice that lots of people around me seemed to be wasting loads of time applying for funding and not getting the funding and therefore not really doing anything so that didn't seem very rewarding um, so I didn't do that um, and instead I found ways to do research it's not I don't have a secret stash of money I just did things that didn't really need money um, which is a lot of things <laughs> um, after that point, I did then start applying for funding for things. And I, it turned out I was quite good at that. But I was probably quite, I was probably able to do that because I put in an, a decent amount of time establishing a reputation just for being somebody who could function as an academic and come up with some ideas and things. Um, the other thing, that's the other, it's my other critical observation about Canada. I think I've only got two of those. I love Canada. Canada's great. Don't worry. Very happy I moved to Canada. We have Brexit in the UK, which is a stupid racist thing. Didn't like that. That wasn't good. I'm not saying any of that was good. Move to Canada. Canada better. Okay, good. Canada safe. We like Canada. But I've already said my one thing about uh, Canadian academia seeming kind of conservative. And the other thing is that people seem obsessed with funding to the point where they just don't do stuff because they didn't get the funding, which I think is, I've seen that happen quite a bit. And and obviously, if you had some really ambitious plan and you put in some funding bid for it and you didn't get the funding, then you're not going to be able to do that thing. So fine. But it seems to happen at all different levels. Like I was listening to a podcast the other day where somebody said they were they were going to do a feminist reading group. And they so they applied for some funding for that, but they didn't get the funding. And and she didn't even say, therefore, we're not doing it. But it was clear the implication was, you know, obviously, we're not doing it because we didn't get the funding. So we're not going to do it. But that seems crazy because you do your feminist reading group anyway. That's fine, isn't it? The, the funding was only to have a few, you know, some coffee and cake. We can we can access coffee and cake in different ways. We may have to get our own coffee and cake, but that's okay. Um, the, the thing where you apply for funding and then don't get it and don't do it is not a good plan, I think. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and following yeah. funding that's offered. Sorry, I'll just say the other thing. The, the thing about just being or looking for funding sources and sort of doing things because that seems to be where funding is. I don't think that's a good way to go. I think you should follow your passions and, and try to bend 
other people's things like their funding opportunities to fit with your passions because it's going to be much you're going to be much happier for one thing yeah sure no i was going to say that that's definitely very good advice and that's something that you learn coming from uh i don't know south america in my case or colombia when absolutely funding is not there is not a lot of funding for education or for phds and a lot of graduate programs in the country so this is like a norm from other places and i think that it pays out um it pays off like it is really, uh, um, I was, I'm grateful that I grew up there because now you, uh, I, I think that you have, when you have big plans in a place like that, you have to get very creative about the ways that you uh, get the money for doing something. And if it's not money, then you get the people or the resources or something. And it's absolutely a good, a good thing to just keep doing it, even though it's not the, I don't know, it's not exactly how you were dreaming that the thing would be. But I think that it's still you get it out there and it's still you get the benefit of doing it. So yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Oh. I did have a version of this slide which put italics on the word lead. So it's like, don't be led by funding, but obviously you need funding. And, and that seems fair enough. But then I got rid of the italics. And actually, I think don't be led by funding. <laughs> uh, funding can be really useful for doing things, but uh, don't be led by it. That's what I mean. Don't get stuck in a weird niche. That's the other thing about that happens everywhere, though. That's not that's not just Canada. In Britain, yeah, like often I would get new PhD students who thought the very definition of a PhD was that it was a weird niche. They thought that that's what like I'm I'm maybe starting off with some quite broad interests, but what I need to arrive at in order to to proceed and do and get a PhD is to have identified my weird niche and just do that. Um and I think that's a terrible idea. <laughs> I don't like, um, I mean, I like weird. Uh, weird. Weird is good. I don't mean, uh, you know, <laughs> but things don't have to be in a niche. It doesn't have to be obscure. Like, especially if we're talking about PhDs, a P the point about PhD is that it's meant to be some interesting new information about the world. Not, no one ever said it was meant to be like obscure or, or very narrow. Um, and I think people think that. And then beyond PhDs, people think that about sort of carving an academic career. They think, well, I need to occupy a really, really distinct slice of territory that nobody else is on because then I can do that. And, and there's, I, there's not too many people doing that. And, and so that's a good idea. Uh, but then you just end up being very narrow and narrow isn't actually good or interesting. And, and the definition, the thing that defines the very narrow thing is that nobody's interested in it. Basically, <laughs> There's like two or three people interested in that. That's because you, you've gone too narrow. So you don't want to get that narrow because it makes any sense. That's that point. Well, I, and I think that the, if you kind of compare this don't get stuck in a weird niche with a past slide that you had talking about creating a new and uh, a whole new um, I don't know area of uh -huh. um, research, I think that is just about finding the right balance. Then I mean, just not doing something adding to a pile, but also not doing something that only you know or i don't know yeah. something about that so it's and it about balance that, you would say or yeah and it could be that you open up a niche that becomes then a whole new world and then that would seem good if you find some way in which there's something which is currently kind of neglected or sidelined and you're able to sort of take that and sort of blow it up and show its importance or you know expand the the play space in that thing that would seem really good um yeah so all i mean is just don't don't head for something really obscure because you think that's what you should be doing. So I think that's not what you should be doing. Um, it's, yeah. Because it, be, it can be quite comforting to just be in, a, in your cosy little niche that nobody else is interested in. But it seems disappointing to be carving out that bit of space when it could be something that has got broader interest and appeal. That makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, let's do another one. Hmm. This is the excuse that people make when they're being cautious. They say people in my field only respect, like people in my field only respect peer-reviewed articles in these five journals. So that's what I'm going to do. Or people in my field only respect some other particular way of doing things. It either isn't true or people in your field are wrong anyway. <laughs> so, uh, like there's always scope for doing more other interesting things. And you might be in a field where there's a kind of really established way of doing things. But then I bet people are sick of that anyway. That's why I wrote down another slide that's probably next. Um, if, if you think that your field seems kind of stuffy and is always doing things in the same kind of way and that's a bit boring, 
there's going to be other people who think that too. And they're all just kind of waiting for somebody to kind of shatter the tedium. So joining in with those people is much better than thinking, oh, I need to fall in with what everybody's doing. Otherwise, I'll never have any success in this area. So I don't think that's true. I definitely think that uh, you will have success in that area by doing something different. This is the bit where I look at Valeria to see what her face is saying. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I know. I see your face. I, I, ha I have you here. And I'm like thinking about, about this uh, prompt. And I think that this is something that every researcher thinks about. And I find it interesting that we're having this conversation with you. And uh, I'm not, of course, representing any other students, but I come like I'm a student and I'm a master's student. So, of course, I'm in the other side of the coin thinking, yeah, well, but people in my field <laughs> only respect this and that. And it's just finding the balance about, you know, the the things that you think that you actually have to do and the things that you really, really uh, have to, to do and think about, but it's just, you just hurt messy and it, it can get confusing sometimes and just the pressure of academia on the shoulders of everyone. Mm. Um, but this, this just goes back to your other ideas about getting noticed and doing original stuff and doing new things and trying and making mistakes probably on the way, but yeah, yeah I think that that's mm. the goal. Yeah, you have much more fun doing that as well. Um, and I think like it's possible that like you might listen to me saying these things and think, oh, well, it's easy for you to say these things because you've already arrived at a certain kind of position. And so, you know, that kind of thought. Um, but I always just did uh, <laughs> the things that I thought seemed interesting and fun and ignored the other things. Uh, like uh, my my the number of times I've done a peer reviewed journal article is very small because it just seems too tedious and nobody reads the things and I hate it. And the process is just, the process takes forever and you always get some arsehole popularly known as reviewer two, who uh, just thinks that you should have written a totally different article about the thing that they're interested in. And they write all that down a great length. And then, and then you kind of meant to do what the reviewers said, which always seems I've never had a thing that's got better because of what reviewers have said about it. And that sounds arrogant too, but it's true. You always have to change it and make it worse. And you wish that you could have just done the original one. All of that just is very frustrating to me. Um, whereas I found the process of writing books much better. And you might think doing a book is harder than doing an article if only for size reasons. Um, but at least in a book, in a book, you have the freedom to sort of create a whole world of argument. You can set out the whole sort of thing that you want to do. And, and it's a beautiful kind of unit. And everybody knows what a book is. So you can tell your mum that you've written a book. And it's like, fantastic. You tell your mum that you've got an article in the International Journal or something or other. And it's like, it, what, what, what is that? Is that good? <laughs> no one knows what that is, except people in academia. Um, so, so books I found much more congenial. And you still have, you know, they still have oversight. They get reviewed after you've written them. And I love being reviewed after you've written the thing. What I don't like is when you get reviewers that try to stop you writing what you want to write and tell you you should have written what they'd have written. Because it's just annoying. Um, so then I also want that model to apply to you know, there is the model of publish, then there's this post-publication peer review. I like that model where you can, people publish stuff, gets put out there. The internet is what, this is what the internet's for. Put stuff out on the internet, can be reviewed afterwards and people can draw attention to things they think are good because we now have to do that on the internet. That's a good model. The model that's all about, it uses up a lot of academic time doing all that filtering so that certain voices don't get heard. I don't think that's good. I'm going to move on. I'm getting near to the end of these slides now, and then we can have a bit more of a chat. Um, probably said this, yeah, I've said this already. Don't think you have to be conservative just because the field seems conservative. Other people are sick of it too. I'm pleased with how I've written that down, but I don't need to say any more because I've already said that. But that's got to be true. If your field seems like a conservative field, and you get this all the time, I know like people have film studies like, oh, well, we only do things in this particular way in film studies, and we only go to these particular things, and we do this particular bunch of stuff. And there's lots of other fields like that or subfields like that. Um, but if you're fed up of it, other people will be fed up of it. And you just need to start doing things differently. Good. The impact staircase, we're nearly at the end. What is the impact staircase? I'll just do this. I'm speeding on now so we can have a more conversational thing, right? Um, the point is this. That is your lovely research. And if you want to have impact in the world, this stems from being in the UK where impact is a whole discourse within academia because you get actual 
re literal, literal financial rewards in the long run your university does if your research if the research of a body of people is having impact and they have, and they measure impact by seeing to what extent research has been noticed by people outside of academia that's what they do it's a whole big thing um which then becomes an industry of its own and has a bureaucracy of its own so it's i'm not necessarily recommending it but the focus on impact is is healthy uh in that it's about are you doing stuff that's made any difference beyond your little academic community I think that's a good thing to be looking at. Lots of people find it annoying that this is being measured and, and, and so on. And the bureaucracy around it is annoying. That's true. But the intention is good, I think. And then the question is, right? So there's this diagram here. This is on your screen. I'm pointing to it. You can't see that. Um, your lovely research is down there. You want to get to impact, which is up there. How do you get from there to there, it's really hard. Like you can't just get from there to because you because you just go, there's, no, there's no way to step from one thing to the other thing because the other thing is high and far away. So the answer has to be a step in the middle. What is the step in the middle? The step is so that you can go dying, 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 get up to impact. What is the step though? The step is basically anything interesting that you can do to get from your research to impact. And the point about that step is you create that step. So it's a matter of doing anything in the world that draws any connections or attention or makes use of your research in some way to connect it with the actual world. And then you're able to get dun, 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 up the staircase. Otherwise you can't. So it can be like uh, talking about your stuff in social media. It can be about talking about your stuff in mainstream media. It can be making videos and podcasts and participating in all that kind of conversational world, which lies some way halfway between academia and everybody else, anything like that. Um, and, my staircase model, uh, yeah, that became sort of known and popular in the UK as a way of explaining how on earth we're meant to get from impact. Because everybody knows I've got my research here. I like my research. I spend lots of time on it. It's good. I would like it to have impact, but impact's up there. How do I get up there? What's the answer? The answer is you need that step in the middle. And importantly, only you will create that step. The other mistake that people make is that they sort of know that something needs to connect their research to impact, but they assume that somebody else is going to do it, or they sort of think, our oh, university's got a marketing department, so can't they do that? Or something like that. But that's never going to happen, because, you know, what's their motivation? The motivation lies with you to do something, to get your stuff connected into the world, noticed, connected with some form of industry or organization or NGO or whatever it is that might mean that then it can actually go somewhere and be useful. Um, Mm. Um, however, I, I was thinking about impact, and I think that that is a huge part of the research. And I think that we, we, when we apply for funding or something, we always, even for applying to, uh, to get into an university, you get asked what kind of impact or what is the, um, yeah, what, what will happen, how, how this can affect everyone in a good way or the benefits of your research. And I think that that's something that puts a lot of weight sometimes in the shoulders of some academics saying, so I have this great idea and I like it because it's interesting for me, but I don't actually know how this is gonna change the world. And sometimes uh, people think that they have to make these things super, um, I don't know, like applying for everyone or it's gonna solve a lot of problems and all of this. So I don't know how much uh, focus should we put into the impact of our research uh, I, I think that sometimes it doesn't have to be something that you have, like you impact everywhere, but something locally, but I don't yeah. know what, how can you think when you're doing something in terms of impact, like, I don't know. If you have yeah, impact can take many forms, as you say, and it, it, yeah, a local impact is just as good as, you know, anything else. And... And the first thing is always that you need to do your good and interesting research to start off with. That needs to be solid. I'm kind of taking for granted here that that is solid, but that needs to be solid. Um, and then, and then there is the effort that I think is worth making to try to get it to connect with the world and get people to know about it. Because it, the, there's nothing more sad than your marvelous research that nobody knows about. Um, but the effort to get it known about still lies with you. That's the thing that I think some otherwise very intelligent people seem to miss. <laughs> they, they seem to, they, they do great research and then they're kind of baffled that nobody's paying attention to it. And that's just, it's not because it's not even, it's not because of anything to do with the research. It's just people don't, people don't even know about it. They haven't, and those people that created it who do know about it haven't made any effort to connect it into the world. And that job of connecting it into the world is a thing that is actually part of our jobs. 
um, even if you feel like you're not well suited to it or whatever, um, I think you sort of still need to. I mean, I'm secretly like quite shy and an introvert and all that kind of thing. Um, but you have to sort of make the effort otherwise because yeah. it's just... Yeah. And that's something related to the fact that the ideas we were discussing before about being conservative in the field. I mean, sometimes you think that the way to do things is this way, but like you were saying, we often forget about being active on different kind of social media or starting your own blogs or doing collaborations outside of academia. Sometimes you are not exactly sure if you're going to be in academia or not, but in either case, I think that uh, making connections and talk about your research outside of um, university or something. Mm. Yeah. And I think, yeah. Yeah. I think starting out researchers are often understandably, I think, concerned about sort of being taken seriously and looking like they're proper. So like you don't do podcasts, you don't have a website, you don't do social media because you don't want to, you don't want it to embarrass you in some very formal academic situation later on or something. But, um, but I think that's a mistake. If we get job applications or PhD applications or whatever from if it's somebody who's like got interesting, lots of interesting stuff online and they do a podcast or you think, oh, great. How interesting. That's nice. That's the kind of stuff where you light up and think, oh, that's exciting. Um, I will do the last, if it is the last. Oh, I know what. Close to the end, right? There's like one bit, one summary bit, then that's it, okay? Uh, I thought I'd see... <laughs> uh, I, I, I looked in my mind to see what I'd ever said about any kind of advicey things before, and it turned out that in 2016... I did a blog post called Unsolicited Advice on Your Academic Career, <laughs> uh, which is not a bad title, at least. Um, the article contained a bunch of thoughts. The one I picked out was this one. I thought, yeah, um, I, agreed. I agreed with 2016 me on this point. So I'm going to say this point now, and then we're right near the end of this bit of slides. Um, so it's been talking... It, it leads up to this point, but it ends up saying, this is the fundamental dissonance which makes everyone's head hurt in the arts, humanities, and social sciences, I think. You're surrounded by peer and management pressure, which is all about papers in top-ranked journals and about getting that million pound grant. At the same time, you gaze along your bookshelf and you're pleased to see Michel Foucault, Bell Hooks, Anthony Giddens, Cindy Sherman, Hannah Arendt, and you're pretty certain that none of them wasted any time trying to finalize a list of 14 deliverables for a Shirk-funded connections grant. i Canadian if I did it for you there. Or burying their best work in the International Journal of Locked Away Pseudoscience. Um, all of those people who are your academic heroes didn't do all the conventional things that we hear these days is what you need to do in academia. Um, but I think it's probably a good idea to take those people as your role models. Um, because they're the ones we've heard of, whereas there's loads of people who've got really big grants from funding organizations, and they've got a good number of articles in peer-reviewed journals that nobody reads, and nobody knows who they are, and we don't talk about them, and, we, you know, and nothing. <laughs> uh, and those people who maybe, not necessarily those people, you know, I just put down some people who are among my heroes, uh, but think of your own heroes, they probably haven't got bogged down in the, all the most boring bureaucratic kind of ways that people tell you that you need to succeed in academia. They've done other things. So that was that. In other words, passion, communication, and not being too cautious. That's what it all seems to boil down to. Good. Hooray. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop screen share. Valeria, did you have any concluding thoughts before we do general Q&A or anything you want to talk about? Uh, well, no, I think that this was very helpful. I, I think that it was great to, to talk to you. And I, I know that you want to say, oh, I don't have all the answers or anything. And of course you don't. I don't think that anyone really does have all the, the, the answers. But just having a space to talk about this, I think that is key and important. Um, just to know that there are other people having same insecurities or just the same uh, ideas about, oh, I'm not doing enough, or um, is it okay that I'm doing this this way? Should I be doing more or something else, something like that? So having these kind of spaces, I think that is um, great just to be talk having these conversations about academia in outside of academia, if, if like not in a classroom or anything, but just another space to be talking about doing research and stuff. Yeah. So I think that we can, if uh -huh. it's okay with you, just have some 
questions from everybody else? Yeah. No? I'll just say, um, yeah, that, that's that's a nice way to put it in terms of conversation. And I feel silly saying, you know, like this is I'm saying this is what you should do, or su suggesting what I think is a good idea. But um, but but what can one do? I'm floating some ideas about what is a good way to act in academia and you can ignore them or pay attention to them according to your own choice obviously i know you can take or leave them and i'm not saying i have the actual answers but at least it's something to talk about okay let's see if we've got any questions from anybody it can be about anything really <laughs> anything about the world of academia or the general thing that this session is meant to be about is about getting on in academia or that kind of thing you can talk we can talk about whatever you want i think that daniel has a a question i think that we can start with that one yes hi um hi. i have a bit of a spicy inquiry into this talk which is um i mean to get a job post phd you do have to demonstrate that you have a record of publication and you know uh Financement, what is it in English? You were just talking about it, uh, grants and stuff. So saying to not depend on grants and funding and publications is not, I feel like that might be a little bit of a, I don't know if that's a great tip concerning the current like neoliberal hyper-competitive job market. Mm. So that's not a question, but that's a comment on that specific tip, I guess. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, part of that, I uh, I have to play my excuse that I come from a somewhat different context and all of that. Yeah, there is the thing where you do the tenure track journey and at the end of that, when you're meant to have a whole bunch of things. I mean, obviously, I'm not saying don't do anything. I've never said that. I've said do uh, in, you can do interesting alternate things to the things that seem to be being demanded. Uh, and then it is a risk that you're hoping that other people will accept that they are as good. Like the thing about books instead of uh, journal articles, that's uh, <laughs> uh, if you'd done X number of books, then people wouldn't be upset that you hadn't done the journal articles as well because they're like, oh, it's books, so that's good. Um, funding, yeah, I think if you've if you've made your mark with in some other ways, then uh, now I'm not sure to what extent you get uh, uh, people would be disappointed you've not got funding or not. In Canada, uh, one difference in Canada is that you, you seem to have more but smaller grants. Um, where I come from, well, then there's a smaller number of them handed out, but they're for bigger amounts. Um, and here it seems that there's lots of little ones, basically. Um, so in that sense, it's perhaps easier to get them. The success rates are higher here. It's, it is easier to get a grant. Um, of a smaller size so yeah I'm not saying to, uh, I shouldn't say don't follow that path that's true um but also I hate it when people are spending all of their time applying for stuff that they don't get and then they're just burning up loads of time doing that when you could have used that time doing actual work which you could then publish about and that would be good and, and would be better than the failed funding attempts of course you need to do some failed funding attempts before you get successful funding attempts so it's, yeah it's not simple, that's true. Um, I'm, I'm seeing here, uh, Emily. Hi, nice to see everybody today. Thank you so much for hosting Hello. in Valeria. Um, I was just wondering in terms of trying to find uh, spaces for collaboration in the current kind of virtual time that we're in. And I think that, like personally, I think research collaboration isn't um, as, highly valued in, in some of the fields that we see here. So I would count that in, in a certain way as, as a, a bit of an innovative practice for some of us, but like I'm in all these classes and I read these studies that are done by six or seven people. And I'm just wondering how did they find each other and how did they convince each other to work with each other and how can I do that? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, weren't you, you were making that in COVID times as well at the start of that question, were you? Yeah, well, it seems particularly hard now um and as i think uh, as well for our, our new masters too. i mean i'm a second year masters in the in the program here um so there are a couple of people who i've been able to get to know it hasn't been the right person but i can say i've at least had those opportunities where if somebody was in a similar uh kind of research space as, as i was i would have been able to latch on to them and i have made quite a few friends in the program but 
in terms of COVID for, for newer students or newer PhD students, I, I've been hearing it's really hard to make those uh, connections, especially where professors aren't like setting up small groups in classes or, you know. Mm. Yes. I don't necessarily have the answer to that one. I mean, because we've all found some ways, probably. I don't know if anybody else wants to suggest any things that have worked for them. Um, and I'm in a different position to you. Um, I mean, it is still the case that by doing good and interesting things that people notice, then some people may then seek to connect with you or it'll be easier for you to connect with them because they'll look at you and they'll be like, oh, you've done those good and interesting things. So it does come back to doing the good and interesting work and doing something to get it out into the world. So those points remain. Um, but yeah, it is harder, isn't it, in COVID times? Everything I've said so far has been largely ignoring the COVID thing, which has been going on for the past, you know, eight, nine months, because uh, I'm talking about in normal times. And COVID adds these challenges, doesn't it? Uh, sometimes uh, prompting us to do things that otherwise we wouldn't have done that actually turn out to be quite interesting. Um, and sometimes just making life difficult as we know uh i think we've probably all found certain useful ways to connect using the internet which we were previously aware may or may not have existed but uh, we weren't really trying them because you thought well i don't need to do that i can just go out and have a cup of coffee with somebody or whatever um or meet people in conventional ways and 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 now we're being forced to be more inventive about that uh but it's hard for sure i think that part of what we are talking today is we were talking about it before, it's just about adaptation and not just with COVID, but with every other situation in life where something happens and then you have to kind of pivot and adapt to any kind of situation that is going on. I mean, not just COVID, but not being accepted to the program that you wanted to, to go to or something like that. It's just trying to find new creative ways to do it. And I think that sometimes it's just taking the initiative to do it yourself. Um, so for example, you were talking about how do you connect with someone uh, or find this group of people that are, that are all related or that have the same goal or something. And sometimes you just have to send an email or something like that. I mean, I, I know that it sounds like a simple thing, but sometimes you have to go do it and go ask for help and go, you know, just contact the, the person and say, Hey, I, I see that you're doing this, etc., And just, um, make it happen kind of way in, in the way of like uh, actually going out there and talking to someone about it probably yeah yeah i was going to say reaching out to people in covid times maybe i mean to some extent some, some some of us are just too overwhelmed and can't really you know we don't want even more things coming at us but uh it, it can also be the case that if you reach out to somebody in these covid times some other people are feeling more receptive or more just pleased that somebody's reached out and said hi and um yeah having the courage at least to reach out to somebody who you think might be interesting to work with and you know what's the worst that can happen it is definitely worth doing i i think i've uh, made some interesting new connections in covid times because you're sort of delighted and surprised that somebody reaches out to you or, or suggests the thing it's like oh, yeah, yeah. um and at the same time we're all finding it hard for different reasons it's a mixed bag um is that hi. a Hi, Hello. Um, this has been great. I just wanted to say to this point of uh, COVID and trying to connect, I have found that um, I've made connections just by being proactive in the sense that we have the time, we don't need to go to things. Um, you know, most organizations, most depending on the area you're in, um, are having Zoom talks and lectures and things like that. And I think attending those, it's very helpful. And I just started doing that because I'm the type of person that needs to attend things. I need to sort of be there. Um, so I've been attending things happening in the UK at 5 a.m. Um, I don't have to, but I want to because they're related. And so I've actually been contacted by a couple of organizations asking me to contribute and now I'm just kind of like, uh oh, um, but I think just being proactive, you know, just uh, joining organizations if they're a part of your, uh, uh, you know, uh, academic area that you're in. I have actually found that I've been more connected than I ever was before. And I'm glad because, you know, a lot of the things that I'm engaged with are overseas or in the UK. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It's true, isn't it? Because like, um, 
you can now basically go to more things because you don't have to go anywhere. They're just in your computer now. So, so you can go to, you know, events in different countries, uh, sort of nominally in different countries and connect with people in lots of different ways because everything's on Zoom now. So you don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that point. Yeah, and I've done more things like that. It's true. I um I thank you for this and thank, thank you for the for the for the presentation. Um so I, I have two things. First, I just want to say thank you for one, like acknowledging your privilege and and research sometimes as a person of color seems uh or becoming an academic seems very distant um and and a challenge. So I appreciate you kind of making that space safe and making it not seem so distant. Um so then my my second question. Uh, or I guess that was my comment. This is my first question. Um, so I see I see some contract lecturers in the room, and um, I think we are kind of in like a, a, a weird spot because we're teaching, um, and then students come and ask us to supervise their work uh, and their and any the theses or, or or whatever they're working on, major research projects, uh, and we um, it's not something that we get compensated for or, or anything like that mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if there's potential or opportunity for us to leverage students uh, working with them in a supervisory role where we can then publish works or what can what can we do working with students that might work favorably for us when we apply for PhD programs or for tenure track uh, even if you, and like beyond that uh, is there potential there to do that and, and what does that look like yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, you would probably know more about that than me, but it sounds to me like, um, yeah, opportunities to cooperate ethically with students where, of course, you're, you know, you're respecting who's done what work and, and acknowledging that appropriately, then, yeah, that would give you opportunities to publish things. I mean, publishing things with those students, that's good for you. It's good for them, presumably. Um, and that sounds like a good thing because then you would be increasing your number of publications that would stand you in that good stead that you're talking about. So yeah, that sounds like a thing that could be done. At the same time, I acknowledge that contract lecturers, QP people are in a difficult position, aren't they? Between, <laughs> between sort of not quite part of a thing that sometimes the students think you are part of and, and they ask you to do things that you're sort of not, well, you're actually not getting paid for and all of that kind of, it's a difficult situation to be in. Uh, but as you say, leveraging in some proper respectful way uh, that situation to to increase your number of publications or to increase research opportunities, that sounds sensible. Yeah. I was just going to say uh, something related to the first comment that you, that you made, Chris, uh, about being a person of color doing research. Uh, and I think that it is important that we uh, acknowledge some of the privilege that some of the people have, uh, the challenges that other people uh, carry. I, I do come some, from South America, like, like I said before. And I think that just talking about new research and ways to do things, I think that is also quite important to bring the research um, back to other places and just like change narratives and do research about many different things about different places as well. I think that sometimes in my classes, I found that we focus on things that are happening, of course, here and in the States uh, sometimes, but even though we talk about things happening everywhere, I think that um, it is important to, I don't know, just do research that you, that you want to do, if it's even more important if it's related to something that is not in this, um, like the global north of the world, but just bring the research back to other narratives and just talk about different things and just put them out in the map if you have the opportunity. I think that's, that's something very valuable that that research, researchers can do coming from other places and having the opportunity to be in these spaces. So I just, yeah, I, I just wanted to share that kind of point now that you remind me. Yeah. Yeah, and I acknowledge as well that it's not a very happy thing to acknowledge, but it's like it, it, could, it could well be the case that um, I try out some totally different research, you know, sort of invent a research method and go, hey, world, here's a thing. And, and the world pays attention. And it could be that if I was a person of colour, then the world would be like, oh, you've done that wrong. And, you know, that. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm sure I have benefited from that privilege. I want to add to that because I think like, I mean, it's part of the intention of academic institutions for, for us to it be an educational environment, right? 
And I mean, part of that is like, even when we're teaching someone who, who's a student, like who's at a more earlier level than we are, it's a process of um, getting better, honing our own craft and honing our own thinking. And we have to really keep open the idea that they will, like that process is also going to contribute to us in our learning. But I think the, the part that you're saying is really difficult because it's partly how the system is designed because my university right now, the Free University of Amsterdam, it's going through a, a stage when they want to change the system, but they're having difficulty doing so, or like there's difficulty changing how people want to allocate what's considered meritable. Uh, because they acknowledge that, yes, there's a problem when we only evaluate uh, how many publications you have mm. as uh, the road to tenure. And then people who people who teach, uh, that's not so much acknowledged. People who have social, who, who do extra work counseling students, that's not acknowledged. Uh, people who reach out to the community and do things of social significance, that's not acknowledged at all in their tenure track. Mm. Uh, and another thing is like my university is a uh, very like my my side of the department is very much a uh, quantitative based as well. Uh, so it makes like those kind of soft, what they call soft educational resources, ourselves building those things, um, not such a. There's no motivation for us yeah. to do that at all. Yeah. And, and if you think like, if you see someone actually doing that, like they'd either have to be really capable and have the extra time to do that, or they're kind of not very bright and they're not focusing on what they need to be doing to get on the tenure track, but they're focusing on being good people that they feel like they should be. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And there's not any easy answer to that. And I've seen that happen a lot where there's kind of like, lip services paid to people doing things other than the most conventional research or, or only focusing on research and ignoring their teaching like um actually i mean the opposite of that i mean lip services paid to to the importance of teaching but actually then when it comes to tenure and things like that then really they're only concerned about looking at your research record and don't care about that and, and so on uh yeah that's difficult i don't have any great solutions to that one because you have to sort of balance and juggle the different elements to 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 find a way between what's comfortable for you and what you want to do and what the system seems to be requiring. But it is important for people who are not happy with the system to try to collectively be pushing it in a particular direction, isn't it? And it, you can't do it as an individual. It, it needs to be a, a body of people trying to push it in a particular way and saying you need to respect these things and these things need to count and we shouldn't just be looking at these things, we should also be looking at these things. Uh, but it only really a right. It only really, you can make you can only make much difference to that sort of collectively, can't you? You need a, a a certain mass of people saying that. Yeah, totally. Like at my university, there's a group of researchers who are involved in in that movement. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but a majority of researchers don't have time to join their their movement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like a movement they have in the Netherlands. Uh -huh. oh, right. um, and also trying to get funding from the Ministry of Education. So, <laughs> yeah. One thing about that that I was going to say earlier and didn't for some reason was that um, I, I do think it's important to see things in the round, though, like uh, valuing teaching as much as research. And, and those people who just focus on research with the sort of completely single-minded, in that completely single-minded kind of way, which I understand you sort of need to do when you're on the tenure track because the, in Canada... And North America is that sort of block of six or seven years when you really need to get stuff done in order to secure the tenure bit. Um, so I understand that pressure. Well, I've heard about that pressure. I haven't experienced exactly that pressure. Um, but I don't think it's going to be good if you just get the reputation for being an asshole that doesn't care about anything except just doing your own research because nobody likes those people and probably they won't want to employ them in the future. Uh because by being a good colleague and by caring about students, that's good to do anyway, because we want to do that because, you know, we're nice people in the world. Um, and also, it's just an important part of the job that we do. Uh, and you can't get too myopic about just doing research, because that's not going to be good. And, you know, it's no fun as well to, <laughs> to just be focused on a, your own sort of research career and, and not care about students, for example, because ultimately... Hopefully, 
it'll eat away at you. You've been evil. Anyway, I liked your point, Grace. Thank you. And I didn't have a great answer for that, except that it's hard, but it is hard. It's good to acknowledge when things are hard. So uh, thank you all for coming along today. It was nice to have this conversation. I hope that some of it was useful. Um, and it's great of you to join us. So thanks yeah. a lot. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Thank you, everybody. Time. Look after yourselves. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you to Valeria for doing this. Thank you to Catalyst people for doing all of their clever organizational behind-the-scenes stuff. Sure. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You.